Today I'm going to show you how to make beef bone broth in a stock pot on the stove top. We're going old school and this is for those of you who don't have a slow cooker or don't have an instant pot or just simply want to have something simmering on your stove to get the feeling of a true old-fashioned traditional foods kitchen. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, sourdough, ferments, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now for those of you who have been with me for a while, you know that I have lots of videos on making bone broth. Different types of bone broth, beef bone broth, chicken bone broth, turkey bone broth, in the slow cooker, in the instant pot. So there's a big variety of things and I'll be sure to put a link in the description below uh, to the playlist so you can watch those if there's one particular or all that you might be interested in. But today, as I said, we're going to go old school. We're going to do this in a stock pot. I've got about a 10 quart stock pot here and we're going to make beef bone broth on the stovetop. Now if you're new to making beef bone broth, I'm just going to go over the bones that I'm going to use here today. But I want you to know that there's a wide variety of bones that you can choose for when you're making bone broth, specifically beef bone broth. And I have a video which I'll link to in the iCards that will go over all the different types of beef bones that there are that are suitable for making bone broth. And another video which you may want to watch, and I'll link to it in the iCards as well, goes over the differences between broth, stock, and bone broth. They're three different things. And the nice thing about bone broth is that it's the best of all worlds. Bone broth uses uh, marrow bones, meaty bones, and high cartilage bones. So let's go over what we have here. Now this is a marrow bone. And it's called such because it has marrow and the marrow is right here. And I, as I go through these, I'll overlay pictures so that you can see everything up close. But the nice thing about putting marrow bones in bone broth is that marrow bones, the bone contains collagen and that will leach out into your water and create or help to create a gelatinous bone broth. Plus, you get the marrow, which you can either whip back into your bone broth or you can push out and push it out of the bone once it's cooked and put it into a separate container and save it to use to eat. It makes a wonderful spread on toast. It has the taste of butter with a, like a steak flavor. It's quite luscious. And so that's the benefit of using marrow bones. Next, you want to have some meaty bones. And meaty bones, they add nice color and flavor. And what I've got here are shanks. These are shanks. Now, they also have a little small bone in the middle that has some marrow in it. But the main purpose for using these is for the flavor and the color. And also, the protein that comes from the meat because collagen that comes from the bone is a protein, but it's a different type of protein than the type of protein that comes from the meat. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the collagen, which is a protein from the bones, and then you get the protein from the meat. So you're getting a nice complex of proteins, not just a single protein. And then the third type of bone that you want to use when you make bone broth, which is really the secret ingredient, is a high collagen bone. And in this case, right here, I've got oxtails. And I'll overlay a picture so you can see it up close. And these oxtails are gorgeous. The fat on the oxtails is so yellow. These are all from cattle that were raised organically and grass-fed. And when they eat grass, especially the nice green spring grasses, the fat becomes very yellow because it's very high in something called conjugated, and I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, I'm not a scientist, <laughs> conjugated linolenic acid. But for us lay people, it's great. They abbreviated it, they abbreviated CLA. And it's wonderful for good health. And this looks like it's just loaded with it, with this very yellow fat. And the reason that you want to add these high cartilage bones is that cartilage 
is very high in collagen. Cartilage is higher in collagen than bone. And it's going to release that collagen into the water as the broth simmers, as the bone broth simmers. And this is the secret to make a really gelatinous bone broth. A bone broth that is so gelatinous, it actually looks like jello once it's refrigerated. And the nice thing about oxtails is you have a lot of cartilage, you also have bone, and you have some meat. So you can brown these up so you get a little bit of everything. You get some nice color on them and you get the protein from the meat and you get the protein from the bone and you get the protein from the cartilage. And the cartilage, you know, as I said, that's rich in collagen, just as the bones have collagen. And there's all different types of collagen. So you're getting this wonderful complex variety of proteins. And that's what's so wonderful about bone broth. And you'll see with the oxtail, as the name implies, it's the tail of the animal. Uh, this is the, the centers are what is very, it's almost jelly-like when you press it. And it, that's very high, very high in collagen. So you really want to make sure that you add in some high cartilage bones. And now speaking of these high cartilage bones, and in this case, the oxtails, I know some of you have expressed that oxtails can be very expensive, and that is true. However, I'll link to a, a video in the iCards that I did where I went over the cost of all the bones, and I, I calculated it using organic grass-fed bones. And I calculated that compared to what I was able to buy at the grocery store. And I calculated it based on not only the cost, but the quality. And the good news was, even using grass-fed organic bones the best, including some oxtails, the homemade bone broth was less expensive than the store-bought bone broth. And not only was it less expensive, it was gelatinous and it was delicious. I can't say that for the store-bought bone broth. And I wound up buying the best one that I could find with the least kind of chemical sounding ingredients. And even then, the homemade was so much better. But you knew that I would say just off the top of my head, homemade is always best. But this time we calculated it out and we did a test and so on and so forth. And so I'll link to that if you'd like to watch that video. Now, however, I do want to add, if you don't want to use oxtails or you feel that depending where you may live in the United States or where you may live around uh, the world and oxtails are just way too expensive, then some other options, which I go over in other videos talking about different bones and whatnot, but other options that you can use in place of oxtails that can be substituted for your high cartilage bones are uh, knuckle bones. And let me see if I can pick this one up without <laughs> dropping it. But look at this magnificent piece of cartilage right there. And that is all going to melt and be released into the bone broth and it's going to make it very gelatinous. And knuckle bones are uh, less expensive than oxtails. And you can also use a bone that's called a patella. That's the kneecap. That's also very high in cartilage. And again, less expensive than oxtails. And you may not see them labeled knuckles and oxtails. However, they may just be labeled soup bones. But if you watch that video, if you're not comfortable knowing, if you're especially if you're new to this and you're not comfortable knowing exactly what the patella or the knuckle looks like, you can watch that video where I have all up close pictures and I explain what the bones are. And that way, if you're shopping and you just see soup bones, you can say, oh, there's a knuckle in there, oh, there's a patella in there. And you'll know you've got some nice high cartilage bones to use to make your bone broth. So since I had this knuckle bone, I'm gonna go ahead and just add it right in, even though I've got the oxtails uh, added in for like a little extra boost of collagen that'll help further make my bone broth uh, final product very gelatinous. So since I had that, I'm just gonna go ahead and add that in. 
but that is the mixture of bones that you want. You want your marrow bones, you want your meaty bones like your shanks, and then you want your high cartilage bones. You want some oxtails, you want some knuckles, you want some patellas, something along those lines. Now one bone that I didn't mention that you can definitely add and will definitely make your bone broth very gelatinous is the feet. Now sometimes you can find feet uh, at your grocery store, sometimes you can find them at Asian supermarkets, and sometimes you may even get lucky and find them at your farmer's market, or even if you establish a relationship with a rancher and see if you can buy the feet, they're usually very reasonable. They can go for really about $2 a pound, which is considerably less expensive than oxtails and pretty much less expensive than most other bones. But what I would recommend is, as I mentioned in the beginning, these are organic and grass-fed. I think if you're going to make bone broth on a regular basis and you're going to drink bone broth on a regular basis, you want to try and find the best bones that you can. So if you can find bones that are raised organically or from cattle that are raised organically or from cattle that are raised out on the range and are grass-fed, I highly recommend that because I'm not a fan of using bones that are raised from commercial cattle for various reasons. And I recognize that the uh, organic grass-fed bones are more expensive, but I think in the long run, uh, so many of us who cook traditional foods do this for health and to get the most nutrient-dense foods we want to improve our health or to maintain good health. And so when it comes to making these foods for our budget, when it comes to bone broth, I think that's where we should put our money into good quality bones. I'm not as fussy or concerned when it comes to maybe a chicken at the grocery store. Sometimes I think that if you're new to traditional foods, if you can just get the chicken and cook a roasted chicken, that's often a good start and it moves you in the right direction. But when you come to the point where you're making bone broth, specifically beef bone broth, if you can get organic grass-fed, that's really the way to go. And I have good news because, and I'll put the link in the description below, uh, I buy, you've all, many people have asked me, you know, where do you get your bones? I get them from U.S. Wellness Meats. Or these specifically are all from U.S. Wellness Meats. Sometimes I buy them at the grocery store if I find the quality that I want or the farmer's market or a specialty grocery store. But most of the time I really like to order my bones from U.S. Wellness Meats. And the folks there are so nice, and they gave me a 15% discount code for my viewers. And I'll put the link to that in the description below. So if you do wind up ordering any regularly priced items from them, you can get 15% off. So that makes it well worth it. it. might help the budget a little. Alrighty, well, let's get these into the stock pot. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take these marrow bones, and I'm going to put these into the pot. And the reason is I do not roast the marrow bones. And that is because they really don't have that much meat on them and they don't take on that much color. So instead, what I prefer to do is to put them into the stock pot, fill it with water, add some acid, and let them soak for an hour while I brown the meaty bones. And the reason that I do that is because the collagen that is in bone, as I said, is less I don't know, for lack of a better word, not less strong, but uh, there's less collagen in bone than there is in cartilage. And so I like to let them soak in acidulated water for an hour to help give them a head start on leaching out some of that collagen so we can leach out as much as we can from the bone to help that get into our bone broth to help make it as gelatinous as possible. So I feel the roasting really doesn't add much. I feel that the hour soak while the rest of these are browning helps to get the, the show on the road, so to speak, in terms of beginning to leach out the collagen before we turn the heat on. Now for the acid, I like to use some sort of fortified wine. This is port. 
You could use Marsala, you could use Madeira, uh, you could use red vermouth, anything like that that you have on hand. And the reason I like fortified wines as opposed to just a regular bottle of wine is fortified wines usually just come with a screw top. And it's easy to keep them in your pantry. They're not gonna get an off taste, like the way if you opened a bottle of wine and you didn't finish it and you had a little bit in your pantry, it may take on a vinegar taste over time. And I don't like that. But if you are a wine drinker and you have wine that's you know fresh and on hand and you wanna use that, you can certainly use that. And you just need about a cup. So you can use a fortified wine or a regular wine. However, if you don't want to use any alcohol, that's no problem at all. You can use vinegar. But if you use vinegar, I recommend, and this is in my humble opinion, that you use no more than a quarter of a cup. And you use a nice tasting vinegar like an apple cider vinegar. It doesn't need to be raw, but if that's what you have, uh, that's certainly fine. But just go with a quarter of a cup because a full cup of apple cider vinegar may impart taste to the bone broth that you don't like because the taste may not cook off. And I find that a quarter of a cup, which I've made bone broth with vinegar before, and I've used only a quarter of a cup, and it's definitely been sufficient to extract out the collagen from the bones and the cartilage and made a gelatinous bone broth and didn't have a vinegary flavor. So I would recommend no more than a quarter of a cup. It's gonna be sufficient to do the job and yet not impart a strong flavor. So go with a quarter of a cup if you go with vinegar. But I've got about a cup here of port and I'm gonna go ahead and pour that into my stock pot. And the next thing we're gonna do is just take some water and we're just gonna add enough, just enough to the stock pot to cover the bones. We don't wanna add any more than that because after we brown these bones, we're gonna deglaze the roasting pan and we're going to add the water from deglazing the pan in here. So we wanna make sure that we have room for all of that extra water as well. Now I'm just gonna move these around and just to make sure I've got everybody more or less covered with water and I'll take a picture and I'll overlay it so you can see exactly how it looks. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put these bones into a 425 degree Fahrenheit oven and I'm gonna roast them for about 45 minutes, maybe a little longer, I'll just watch them. You want the bones to take on and the meat to take on a really nice, rich brown color. Well, I had the bones in the oven for about 45 minutes. They look great, nice and brown, which will bring wonderful color and wonderful flavor to the bone broth. And I wanna mention that with the marrow bones and the shanks and the oxtails and this one knuckle, it's approximately five pounds of bones. And given that this is about a 10 quart stock pot, that's a nice ratio. So if you have an eight quart stock pot, you probably wanna look at using four, uh, four pounds of bones. If you have a six quart stock pot, then you wanna go with three pounds of bones. That's a nice ratio between bones and water given the size of the vessel that you're using. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put all of these bones into the stock pot and then we're gonna deglaze the pan. Now I've got a kettle of hot water here. I find this works the best. If the pan has, this pan has cooled a bit, but if you're just taking it out of the oven and it's very hot and you have room temperature water, that usually works well to help loosen all the fond. That's what's called the brown bits and whatnot fond but uh, this has just cooled a bit, so I just used some hot water from the tea kettle to help loosen all of these wonderful brown bits. And then we're going to take all of this liquid that we're using to deglaze this pan and get up all the brown bits, and we're gonna add it to the stock pot. Well, the hot water from the tea kettle did a great job at loosening all the bits, but now the roasting pan or the baking sheet here is a little hot, so I'm just gonna use some pot holders to pick this up very carefully. And into the stock pot it all goes. Oh, <laughs> good job. Now I'm just gonna scrape off these little bits that are left over and go ahead and add this to our stock pot. There we go, just every little bit. There we go, perfect. Well, now that I've got everything in here with all the drippings from the pan, 
the bones are just about submerged. And I'll take a picture and I'll overlay it so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Because this is a very important point that I want to make. You never want to add too much water because too much water is the enemy of making a really nice gelatinous broth. Now, will your, still, will your broth still contain gelatin? Yes. Even if you add too much water, it will be looser, but the gelatin is there. It's just more diluted. And if you're drinking bone broth uh, for certain benefits, specifically for the concentrated gelatin that you can get out of one cup of when you warm the bone broth, but when it's very gelatinous, when it's cold, and then you warm it and you drink it, when it's very high in gelatin or concentrated gelatin and you just drink one cup, that's very good at uh, coating your stomach and improving gut health. Now, if you have it very watery, as I said, it still has the gelatin in it, it's just diluted. So in order to get the benefits of that one gelatinous cup, you would need to drink more cups of it. Now at this point, what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring this up to a boil and immediately turn it down to low. And if you have an electric burner like I do, you're gonna wanna pick it up and put it on a cold burner until the electric burner cools down to low. And when it comes up to a boil, a lot of foam is gonna to come to the top and we're gonna remove that. And the reason we wanna skim that off is because that can sometimes have some impurities or it can make the final product of the bone broth somewhat cloudy. And we always wanna make things as appetizing as possible. But the most important thing is that when it comes up to that boil, we quickly remove it from the heat because boiling the bone broth is the enemy of gelatin because it will, for lack of a better word, I've shared this with you before, those of you who know me, if you boil bone broth for too long, it breaks the gelatin, so to speak. It, and then you're just going to have a watery bone broth. But once we get that foam removed then turn down to low, then we're gonna add in our aromatics. I like to add onions, carrots, celery, a couple of bay leaves, and some black peppercorns. And that's all that I use for my basic bone broth. And once we get all those vegetables in, those aromatics, we top it off with a little more water and we let it simmer on the stovetop for 12 hours. Beef bone broth is sim simmered for 12 hours and chicken bone broth is simmered for six hours. That's a sufficient amount of time to extract a lot of collagen from the bones and from the cartilage. And then you can save the bones if it looks like some of the cartilage hasn't dissolved. You can save the bones and try to make a second batch. Sometimes that second batch will come gelatinous, what we call a perpetual bone broth, and sometimes it won't. And what I discovered from researching this was that it really depends on the age uh, of the cattle from which the bones came, that the bones from younger cattle will have more collagen and the bones from older cattle will have less collagen, which makes sense. Like me, I'm older, I have less collagen. But in any event, so you may get a second uh, gelatinous batch of bone broth or you may not, and we often have no way of knowing the age of the bones that we have. But in any event, if you decide that you use, go, decide to use feet, uh, it seems as though with feet, it doesn't matter how old they are, you seem to be able to get a lot of batches of gelatinous bone broth. But we'll walk through all of that, adding the vegetables and or removing the foam, adding in the vegetables and doing all of that and then straining it and decanting it. I'll walk you through all of that. And this is a, a long tutorial uh, for beginners, but this way I cover everything step by step so we don't leave anything to guesswork. So let's get this on the stove and bring it up to a boil. Alrighty, well as you'll see, it's up to a boil and there's the foam that's come up to the top. We're gonna immediately take it off the heat because I have an electric burner and I'm gonna transfer it to a different burner to let that cool and I'm gonna skim off the foam that's come to the top. And then all you want to do is go in with a spoon and remove some of that foam, just doing the best that you can. I just have a plate behind me here where I'm transferring it to. And you just want to try to get all the foam out that you can with taking as little liquid as possible. And this is going to help the final product look clearer and more appetizing. And we're just going to keep removing that until we get it all gone. 
Well, now that we've skimmed off all the foam and my burner's cooled down, so I've brought the pot back over to my main burner, and now we're gonna add in the vegetables. I like to add in for my beef bone broth, carrots, celery, and onions. They're not peeled. They don't have to be the most perfect vegetables. If they look a little off, it's almost perfect for bone broth. And even if you have scraps that you saved, uh, like the bottoms of celery uh, or the carrot peelings, anything like that is wonderful to add into your bone broth. That all has nutrition. And we're even gonna leave the skins on the onions because the skin of the onion contains nutrition. And the reason why adding vegetables to your bone broth is very important because you're going to get the collagen from the bones and protein from the meat that's going to lead collagen as a protein also, but you get that varied mixture of proteins that come from the bones and the meat that will help to make your uh, bone broth protein rich and gel gelatinous and rich in collagen. But for minerals, you get your minerals mostly from your vegetables as opposed to your bones and the meat. So the more vegetables you add, the more mineral rich your bone broth will be. So basically here I've got six carrots. I've got, um, you know, about eight or so, about six carrots, maybe about eight or so pieces of celery, you know, the, the long pieces, I have it all chopped up here. But it's not an exact science. It's really what do you have on hand? How many vegetables uh, do you want to add? How mineral rich do you want your bone broth to be? Uh, it's really personal preference and really just a matter of what you have on hand. See, I'm putting in the celery leaves. Uh, I often have vegetable scraps that I'll throw in. And this is just one particular sampling uh, of vegetables. You can add all different types of vegetables. Although you do want to be careful about, my God, a celery leaf got away from me. <laughs> you do want to be careful about adding in vegetables that are rich in goitrogens, like your cruciferous vegetables, cauliflower, broccoli, First of all, the taste can be a little off, and also they're very rich in goitrogens, which can be a little hard on the thyroid. So it's not something that uh, you would want to add into a bone broth that you would be drinking daily. Also, I don't like to add in garlic at this point. If I want garlic in my bone broth, I like to add it in after I've made the bone broth. And the reason is I find that in the case of beef bone broth on the stovetop, we're gonna simmer this for a total of 12 hours. You don't need to simmer it for 24, 48, or 72 hours. 12 hours is very sufficient. And if your collagen, uh, your um, cartilage rich bones still look like they have some cartilage on them, you can by all means save them, you can put them in the fridge or the freezer, or you can just turn around and make another batch of bone broth with them. It may not be as rich in gelatin as your first batch. A lot depends on how much cart cartilage is left on the bones, and also a lot depends on the age of the bones. Uh, as I mentioned, I believe I mentioned it earlier, but the, uh, car uh, the collagen in the bones from younger cattle is richer than the collagen in the bones from older cattle, and we often have no way of knowing uh, the origin of our bones, you know, unless we bought them directly from a rancher whom we could ask. But in any event, uh, so you can certainly save them, but 12 hours on the stovetop for beef bone broth is sufficient. But getting back to the garlic, I find that simmering garlic in bone broth for 12 hours can give an off flavor and I don't like it. So I like to leave it out and just add in garlic when I'm either wanting to make a beverage and drink the bone broth or using it as a soup base or a stew base, whatever the case may be. So let's just go ahead and get all of this in here. Then the next thing that I like to add, let me just put this down. The next thing I like to add is a couple of bay leaves. You know me, I always add a couple. I got three here. This one is quite small. Uh, normally I add about two bay leaves and just a little handful, maybe a tablespoon or so, of black peppercorns. And that's it. I like to keep it very simple. And this way it makes for a very versatile bone broth. Now we're gonna add additional water 
just enough to cover so that the vegetables are submerged by no more than an inch. I mean, even less than that. You literally just want to cover because as I've shared with you, if you've seen some of my other videos on making bone broth, and I'll be sure to link to all of those in case you want to learn how to make uh, bone broth in a slow cooker or an instant pot. I have lots of bone broth videos, so you can definitely have, you have options. But what you want to do is you never want to add too much water. And the reason is that because I'm just going to tap these down with a wooden spoon and see if I can get everything submerged. Yes, that's very nice. I really don't want to, and I'll take a picture and I'll overlay it so you can see. I don't want to put any more water than that because if you put too much water, it will dilute your gelatin. Now, certainly that's okay and it still, it still has gelatin in it, but if you're drinking bone broth uh, for medicinal reasons, so to speak, health reasons, uh, whatever the case may be, and you want one cup of bone broth to be very gelatinous, like jello when it's refrigerated and then you warm it gently on the stove and add whatever additional aromatics you want, garlic or turmeric or ginger or just sea salt you want and you want that one cup of bone broth to be very rich in gelatin then when you make your gelatin when you make your bone broth you want to make sure that you don't add too much water to dilute the gelatin that you're extra or the collagen that you're extracting from the bones that makes the bone broth gel gelatinous you want to add just enough water now what we're going to do with this being on the stovetop, I'm going to turn this on high and I'm going to just bring, just so that I can get it up to sort of a, a low simmer, but bring it up kind of quickly. I don't want to reboil it, nothing like that. Just want to get it up to kind of a high simmer and then I'm going to turn it completely down to low. I want the lowest setting possible and then I'm just going to let that simmer for 12 hours. And what you're looking for on a low simmer is where you just see the occasional bubble, like bloop, and then bloop, <laughs> and then bloop, like that. And if you have a food thermometer, you can put it in and what you're into the liquid and what you're looking at is to maintain your bone broth so as to create the most gelatinous bone broth. You want to maintain the temperature at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you don't have a food thermometer, don't worry. The best way to tell on the stovetop uh, when you're making bone broth on the stovetop is by simply looking for that occasional bubble. Bloop, bloop. Bloop, bloop, like that. That's just what you're looking for. You don't want to see, oh, this is my dog Obi-Wan. I've talked to you about her before. You don't want to see a lot of bubbling. You don't want to see a low amount of bubbling. You literally just want to see occasional bubbles. That is the perfect temperature. Well, I brought this up to a simmer, then turned it down to low. I've got everything nice and warm, and I'm just going to put a lid on I'm just going to crack it like this. You don't want, you want to allow for evaporation, um, but the lid can help control any uh, aromas that you may want to have not too strongly permeate, permeating in your home. Well, I've had this simmering on my stovetop for about 12 hours, and I'm going to overlay a picture so that you can see exactly what it looks like. All the vegetables have cooked down, and the meat is softened tremendously, and I have about an inch or two of evaporation. Now what we want to do is just start taking out all the solids from the bone broth. And we're just going to put them all in a bowl. And I want to explain to you what we're going to do with this. Now the vegetables, they're pretty much, you know, had all their nutrition extracted from them over the course of those 12 hours. But what you want to do is you want to look at your bones and the meat. And with the bones, with the marrow bones specifically, and I've got one coming right up here, which I'll go over with you. Let me just put this into here, and I want to pull up this marrow bone. And I want to show you how the marrow is still in there. And I'll take a picture and overlay it so that you can see that up close. What you want to do at this point 
is just get a little knife and push that out on into some type of container or onto a plate, whatever the case may be. You can save it and you can use it as a spread on toast. It tastes very much like butter, but with somewhat of a steak flavor to it, a beefy flavor. It's very good and it's very nutritious. So all you'll do with this marrow is just take that knife and go right through the bone and push it down. There you go. It comes right out. Very easy to do. And that's your beef marrow. And as I said, you can spread this on toast. It really is delicious. And I have a video where I show you how to just roast marrow bones separately just for the bone marrow, if that's something you want to do. And I'll link to it in the iCards and in the description below. But you can also save this and whip it back into your bone broth to make somewhat of a more creamier bone broth. And again, very nutritious. And you can also just add it to regular soups, um, maybe like a beef soup that you're making because it does have a beefy flavor to add extra nutrition. So there's a lot of options uh, for which you can use your bone marrow. So don't discard it. Now as you're fishing out the bones and so on and so forth, examine your oxtails or in the event that you're not using oxtails, examine your other high cartilage bones. And what you want to look for is to see if any of the cartilage still remains. Now, I'm going to take a picture and overlay it of this oxtail, but this is still very soft. There's still cartilage here that can be dissolved. So I am not going to discard any of this. I'm going to make a second batch of bone broth because there's still cartilage to dissolve. Now, will it be as gelatinous as my first batch? Possibly not, or possibly yes. <laughs> Sometimes uh, not only does the cartilage play a role, but the bones, these bones, the marrow bones also play a role because you'll put all the bones back in to make your second batch of bone broth. And I have a whole playlist on making perpetual bone broth, broth in which you keep reusing the bones. And I'll link to that in the iCards and in the description below. Uh, but the bottom line is you never 100% know if your second or your third batch will come gelatinous because the age of the bones plays a role. And if they're bones from older cattle, all of the collagen may have already been leached out of them, whereas the bones from younger cattle still may have some collagen to release. However, that said, if your high cartilage bones, like your oxtails, your knuckles, your patellas, so on and so forth, still show some cartilage on them, you can definitely reuse them to try and make a second batch. Now, what to do with the meat? you have a couple of options. You can rebrown the meat and throw that in again uh, with your second batch, or you can pull the meat off and enjoy it. It's very tasty, especially if you've ever had the meat from oxtails. It's extremely tasty. So, that, so those are your two options. Either remove the meat and enjoy it in some type of recipe, uh, or rebrown it along with your oxtails and your other bones and make a second batch of bone broth. And then, after you make your second batch of bone broth, you can still enjoy the meat. Yes, has a lot of the nutrition been leached out of it? Certainly, after especially making two batches of bone broth. However, it still has some flavor, still has a little bit of nutrition in it, adds some nice texture, and so I highly recommend still trying to put it in some type of recipe. Now I've removed all of the solids from this, and at this point you have a couple of options. You can let this cool down a bit more, and if you have space in your refrigerator, you can put this whole pot in. And then the next day, the beef tallow, the beef fat, will have risen to the top. And you can just score it. It'll be very hard. Um, it'll be either a pale white or possibly with a little bit of a tinge of yellow to it. You score it. Don't throw it out. It's wonderful for using to cook with. But you score it. You can pick it up and take it right off of the bone broth and a lot of the little bits of debris that are in the bone broth will have sunk to the bottom. And then you can just scoop out your gelatinous bone broth, transfer it to another vessel, warm some up to drink, whatever the case may be, whatever way you want to store it. However, and then at the bottom you're going to have, I want to say first, at the bottom the, all the debris will have sunk down there and you can discard that uh, or I sometimes like to give a little bit of it to my dog as a little treat, something like that. However, I generally don't do it this way. I like to take a few more steps to really make the bone broth nice and clear and 
ready to be warmed up in the morning to drink, and I'll show you those steps. What I like to do is get a large vessel. I, I'm using a measuring cup here so you can see exactly what I'm doing. Or sometimes I'll just get another stock pot so I can do this all in one fell swoop, but I want, want you to be able to see. And then I'll get a strainer like this, and then I'll get some flour sack towels. And those of you who may have seen my other bone broth videos, you know I love using these to strain my bone broth. They're very reasonable. I've had mine for years. They wash up beautifully. And you can usually find these at any of the big box stores uh, if you have those in your area. Um, but I'll also put a link in the description below to where you can find these online. And as I said, they're very reasonable and they, they just work like a charm. And what I do is I lie the, let me put it this way so you can see exactly what I'm doing. You lie your cheesecloth over your strainer and then all you do is start to ladle in your bone broth. And then I'm going to show you why I do this. I like to get it nice and clear and this is going to catch every little bit of debris that I was unable uh, to strain out when I was removing the solids. So as you'll see, there's a lot of little bits of debris that I catch on this cheesecloth and I'm happy to get all of that out of the bone broth so that it really starts to look nice and clear. Now my uh, measuring cup here is full. So I'm just going to put this to, to the side. I've still got plenty of bone broth in here, but I'm going to put this to, to the side to show you the next step that I like to take. And again, those of you who have seen some of my other bone broth videos know that I love this little handy dandy fat separator. And I know a lot of you have asked me about it and I'll definitely put a link in the description below where you can find one. But this thing is so clever. It's so much more efficient than the old fashioned fat, fat separators. This has a hole in the bottom and a lever over here. And then what happens is you put your broth in here and the fat rises to the top and then you press on the lever and the little gadget inside that keeps it closed until you're ready to drain something out. Uh, you press the lever, it opens up the hole, and then you can drain off your broth, your bone broth, but then when you see it get down to where the fat is, you can drain that into a separate uh, vessel, which I'll show you. I love how this works because what I like to do is have my bone broth completely fat free and in my container, which I have over here, I, I'll just put it in a half gallon jar. And then I'll go ahead and put this in my fridge. And then in the morning, I can scoop out what I want, warm it up, and my husband and I can enjoy a mug of it with breakfast. Now, if I have any extra, I'll put that in a different half gallon container. And for that one, I won't defat it. I'll let the, I'll pour it right in with the fat from the measuring cup and I'll let the fat rise to the top and it makes almost an airtight seal. And that one I'll put in my back refrigerator and the reason I like to do that is because that somewhat of an airtight seal will keep the bone broth fresh for about a week. Some people say two weeks, I think it keeps it fresh for about a week. Whereas the one without the fat on top will probably stay fresh you know, two to three days. And the one that'll have the solid fat on top, making that somewhat of an airtight seal, it's very easy to remove because when I'm ready to use that second jar, all I'll do is just take a knife, score it, and you can lift it right out. It's very easy to do. So let's go ahead and pour this right into our fat separator. We'll let that fat rise to the top and then we'll decant it into our half gallon jar. And you'll see that the fat has risen right to the top here. So when we press our lever uh, to dispense the bone broth, when I see the fat come down to the bottom, I'll just stop. And I'll take a picture and overlay that so you can see exactly how it looks. Now I'll just put my fat separator right on top of my clean jar here, and I'll just start to dis decant my bone broth. And when I get down to that fat line, whoops, I'll stop, and then I'll put the rest into this little vessel and I'll save this wonderful beef tallow. It's great for using to saute vegetables or cook meat, anything that you want, it's really wonderful. Well, I've got one full half gallon jar here and now we'll get ready to decant the rest. Now I'm just gonna scoop some of this out of here and put it into this little glass because I wanna put this in the refrigerator and let it chill while we finish up the rest of this and then we'll take it out and we can see how gelatinous this bone broth came. 
And so what I've done is take this one that I did not put through my fat separator and I poured that into this half gallon jar, which I'll put in my back refrigerator. And now with this nice layer of fat on top, it'll make a little bit of an airtight seal and stay fresh for about a week. So when I'm ready for it, I'll just take it out of my back refrigerator, I'll score the fat, remove it, and then I've got another nice half gallon of beef bone broth, just like this one, that's already been defatted. Now a common question I get is, can you freeze bone broth? And yes, you can, and it'll last beautifully. I like to keep it in the freezer about two to three months. Some people will say six months, that's certainly possible. Uh, just watch it, because it can develop a little bit of a freezer burn. But I find I use it up, if I do freeze bone broth, I use it up very quickly in any event, so it's usually not in my freezer for more than two to three months. And when I do freeze it, I like to freeze it in one cup measures, or two cup measures. I find these amounts come in very handy for using my bone broth in recipes. And I usually freeze chicken bone broth because that's not something that we generally drink. Not that you can, it's wonderful, but it's generally not something we drink uh, in a mug like we do beef bone broth. It's something I tend to use more uh, in place of water in making rice or other grains, uh, in making gravies, in making soups, so on and so forth. And I like these because they're very thick glass and they have a plastic lid that comes off very easily so that it, although I always make sure I leave sufficient head space, if I freeze my bone broth, in the event that I were to slightly overfill it, all that happens is this just pops off and the glass doesn't break. So you, whatever you do, if you do freeze it, you want to make sure that you're putting it in something that is freezer safe. So, but I like these. I think they're either called French working glasses or French jelly jars, something like that. And uh, I'll put a link in the description below. They're very reasonable. Sometimes they come just the glass uh, without the lid and you have to buy the lid separately. Sometimes they come together. It really varies. And mine are very old. I think now they make them with white lids, but in any event. So that's how I store my beef bone broth or my chicken bone broth if I decide to freeze it. But what I'm going to do is for this little bit of extra beef bone broth that I've got left over, I'm just going to let the fat rise to the top and I'm going to decant the rest of the defatted bone broth in here and just put it in the fridge along with my jar of defatted bone broth. Well, we've got a full gallon and even a little more because I filled over the half gallon mark in each of these jars. So we have over a gallon of beautiful beef bone broth made from grass-fed organic bones, and now we'll get the bone broth out of the refrigerator and see how gelatinous it came. Well, I got this beef bone broth out of the fridge, and look at this gloriousness. Now that's gelatinous bone broth. Let's take the spoon and dig into this. Oh my gosh, this is like jello. Look at this. Look at that gelatinous bone broth. I'll take a picture so you can see it nice and close up. And now all you need to do when you want to enjoy this as a beverage is to scoop out the amount you want, put it in a pot on your stove, warm it gently, add a little sea salt if you like, and you have a wonderful beverage to enjoy. Now if you'd like to learn more about traditional nutrient-dense cooking, be sure to subscribe to my channel and then click on this video over here where I have a playlist of how to make beef bone broth using different appliances, the slow cooker and the instant pot. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.